Read the Bible every day so you'll be full of faith. Welcome you to join Bible Links to read the entire Bible in two years. I believe God will bless you, He will lift you up, and your life will never be the same. The following is the English translation of Pastor Mo Wu's teaching on the book of Numbers, chapter 13 to 14, translated by Ray. Read the Bible every day so you will be full of faith. So in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, here it's talking about when the Israelites then enter into the third stop in the wilderness, which is Kadesh Barnea. However, in this stop, there is a very painful outcome. Here, God brings his judgment. It's a very strict judgment. And out of those 12 spies who went to spy the land, the promised land, 10 out of them die from plague. And their children, their wife, they are also cursed, and they wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And later on, they try to fight their own fight, but they is, it's not according to God's leadership. They try to fight, and they are being killed. So here in the third stop, Kardish Barnia, what happened? Actually, this is deeply related to our Christian life nowadays. So here in these two chapters, we have to find a life principle to teach us how to walk our Christian life. So first, let's read chapter 13, verse 1 to 2. Send men to Spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one of chief among them. So if you just read here, you will think that it's God asking them to send a spy. However, if you compare to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 22 to 23, then you will know that actually God didn't ask them to do it. But the people asked God if they can do it. Because they have been walking in the wilderness for two months, from Mount Sinai to the wilderness of Paran. They have been two months, and they just come here ups and down, and they finally get to the southest part of the promised land, which is Kardish Barnia. And so they have this thought, hey, shall we just go spy, and let's see what it looks like. And Moses thinks it's a good idea. So Moses come ask the Lord, and then say, the Lord said, okay, yeah, sure, then you can send a young leader to go. But here, their families, it's actually not God asking them to do it, but people asking God if they can do it. So here we have to note that the permission from the Lord is different from the promise of the Lord. Sometimes God, because of our desire, our request, God will permit us to do this, but this is actually the second best. Only God's promise is the best best. But sometimes because because the Israelites, they ask for it and the Moses think it's okay. So here there is a special recording in the Deuteronomy chapter 1. But this is actually the seed of a huge mistake that they're about to have in this two chapter. Because we, previous, we usually have this expectation, hey, we want to know what it looks like in the future. We want to first uh, lay out all the game plan to prepare and then so that when we arrive in the land then we will have understanding we know how to face the people but this is our understanding this is not the guidance from the Lord God's guidance is through the cloud through the column of fire through the silver trumpet through these things even though we might not immediately know what's in front of us but because we know that there's God's guidance and his presence however we people always want to know what's the next step but sometimes if we know the next step in advance we'll when we know what kind of difficulties that we are going to face, then sometimes we'll actually lose our reliance on the Lord and we start to tremble because of the circumstances. And here in chapter 13 and 14, the Israelites, they actually fall on this exact thing. So, okay, now send your leaders, young leader, the chief of each tribe. And from verse 4 to 16, you can see that these 12 spies, except for Joshua and Caleb, all the other people, they die. All the other 10 spies, they die. They are the young one, the young leader. Leaders. And this is, they are actually different from the 12 tribe leaders in the beginning of the book of Numbers and also different from the 12 person who make the offering previously. They are here, these people, they are the younger one. They are the young leader. They have the ability, they have the physique to do the spy. But even though they have the ability, they might not be the one who are most mature in their faith. So next, in verse 17 to 20, they said, okay, go up into Negev, and basically it's Kardish Parnia, and then go north until Lebo Hamath, and then come back. So here in verse 20, it's actually about the time when the grape is just bearing their first fruit. So it's roughly in July, and then because they just passed the Passover, and then they walk for like two months. Actually, these uh, two distances is 
you only need to walk for like two weeks. But because there are more than two million people, Israelites are walking, so it's been like two months. So you can see that God's leadership, they aren't walk in a fast or hasty pace, but God just lead them like step by step. And these two months, God is trying to train them so that they can mature up in their faith until they arrive at Kardish Barnia before they are about to enter the promised land. Then the people say that, hey, can we enter can we go spy and look at it so even though god permits them to do that but this is not god's promise or his arrangement but anyway the spies still go there from the wilderness of zim to rehab so rehab is in the middle and then to lebo hama which is the northeast part of the promised land so they go from the gap to hebron which is like roughly the place of jerusalem and remember that hebron is the place where abraham isaac and jacob they buried themselves and also so, so you can see that this is the promised land that God promised to Abraham. But when they enter into the valley of Ashkol and then they came back and they carried a single cluster of grapes on a pole, which is gigantic. So yes, this is indeed a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So flowing with milk means that this place is very suitable to raise livestock and flowing with honey means that it's good for farming, either it's tree or other plantation or having raising the beehives or maybe plants something like dates and next in verse 25 to 29 at the end of 40 days they return from spying out the land so they spend 20 days come out go out to the north and 20 days come down to the south so you can see god definitely god is guiding them through the process and they see the entirety of the promised land and in verse 27 we came to the land which you send us it flows with milk and honey and this is its fruit so yeah indeed it's a land with milk and honey glorious abundance of the promised land but in 28 and 29 they also report some facts the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large and beside we saw the descendants of Anak there the Amalekite dwell in the land of Nagab the Hittite the Jebusite and the Amorites dwell in the hell country and the Canaanite dwell by the sea and along the Jordan so basically they're just talking about what it looks like people dwelling here in the south in the north in the middle all these things they are facts but from God's perspective, you will see that this is the land flowing with milk and honey. But from man's perspective, you will just all see all these tall, great Canaanites. Actually, in the Bible from Genesis and Exodus, whenever it talks about the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, God always also talk about the seven tribes of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the descendants of Anak, and Malachite. God always connect. Whenever he mentioned the promised land, he always mentioned these Canaanites. So the combination of these two is actually a sign. So what is the sign? That means like when the iniquity of these people are full, then we will lead you to that place and drive those people out and we will bring, I will bring you to the promised land. This is what God has said in Genesis and Exodus. When he promised to Abraham, when he called to Moses, he keeps saying the same thing. So now they really see it, see as what God has said, but they did not understand. They now see it. They see the promised land, but they also see the Canaanites, the descendants of Anak, the strong people. If we don't understand God's guidance, then we will feel, we will see that, oh wow, so many blessings, but there are also so many difficulties. From God's perspective, you will see that, oh, all these difficulties, these challenges, this is exactly testifying that this promised land is ours. This is the way God showed his promise. So we can definitely drive out these people. This is the sign that God gave us. The purpose of these Canaanites is to tell us that this promised land is exactly ours because God wants to drive these people out. This is his beautiful plan and this is God's perspective. But if our perspective is incorrect, we will see the beautiful stuff. We will see the promised land. We will see the abundance. But we won't see these difficulties as a sign. We won't see it as a promise. It was that ah, it's so scary. So many challenges, terrifying. So you can see that seeing God's promise from His perspective versus seeing the circumstances from man's perspective, there's a huge difference. So indeed, next in verse thirty, but Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, "Let us go up." at once and occupy it for we are well able to overcome it so we have to make this a habit that we first let the people with the greatest faith to first speak but next in verse 31 to verse 33 
Ah, no, 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 no. They are so strong. They will devour us. They are of great height. We look like grasshopper. So you can see that different people they see the same thing, but there is a very different conclusions. For the people with faith, they says, "Let's go. We can get that land." You see, this is God's promise. And then next day, they, they see the difficulties. They first see God's promise, and then talk about the difficulties. But and because of these difficulties, this is a proof, a testimony. That God has promised this land for us, but for man's perspective, we'll only see the challenges. Ah, this is so challenging. How is it possible? It's impossible for we to receive the promise. No,、oh, we will definitely fail. We will die. Impossible. You know, these two things are very different. So God's promise, He always connect the. Promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, with the Canaanites. So, what do you want to see first? Are you looking at the promise first, or do you look at the circumstances first? So, this is something that we need to learn, especially if you are an intercessor. You frequently see a lot of visions. Either it's about your church or about the entire nation, or maybe you are a very analytical person. You are strong in your logic, your addition, your ability in discernment. I have to tell you that today you really need to pray these things. Is that whatever thing. That you may see, or whatever conclusion you may analyze, it's all about whether or not in my spirit are you mature enough. If your spirit is mature enough, when you are describing something, then the outcome that you will bring is to promote people's faith. But if your if your spirit is not mature enough, then the thing that you say exactly the same thing will actually make people tremble and lose their faith. So it will have very different consequences. You know, some very powerful intercessor whenever they are praying, they can just feel the guidance from the Lord. They will see all the challenges and difficulties of the church. Some very analytical person, they can do a lot of anal analysis. Oh, here will be the financial challenges, interpersonal challenges. We'll have some resistance. How can we prepare beforehand? All these things they are facts, but for people who are mature in spirit, it will bring out different actions. So, like for Caleb and Joshua, they are mature in spirit. They say, "Let's go up at once and occupy it," because they know this is God's promise. It's always accompanied with the challenges from the Canaanites. So they know that the presence of those Canaanites is a proof and tell that yes, we it's the exact time for us to go and occupy the land. But for people who are immature, they see the same fact. But what they will say that oh, they are the great people and. We are the grasshopper. We cannot go. So definitely, it's not up. To, it's not about what kind of content that you pray. It's not about the vision that you see. It's not about how good you are about logic and analysis or how accurate your analysis is. The only thing that matters is whether or not your spirit is mature or not. So today we can really pray that Lord may help me to mature up in my spirit. And also Jesus has said one thing. He said, "I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation." But take heart, I have overcome the world. So for people who have mature spirit, they will hear that yes, we have peace because God has overcome the world. But for people who is immature, he will only hear that oh, there will be tribulation, and then they just can't hear anything else. So ah, it's so scary to believe in Jesus. There will be tribulation. But for people with mature spirit, they will hear that yes, we can take heart because you have given us the peace, and Jesus has overcome the world. So today, their families, your maturity in the spirit really did. Determines how we see things and the later on action that we have. Maybe today you are facing the challenges in your marriage, in your marketplace, your boss, your company, or maybe your school. Important decision about your kids. So many pressure. You don't know like what, either you should choose A or choose B. But the first thing that you should ask God to pray is not that Lord help me to know which one to choose. But the first prayer that you should have is to say, Lord, may you help me to mature up in my spirit. Help my spirit to be mature enough so that I can trust you. I can believe in you. I know your promise will be fulfilled. Let me can trust you. Let me walk in your schedule. You have your way. I will trust the guiders, the leadership from the cloud and the silver trumpet. So, dear families, this is our priority prayer list today. Christians often are praying that, Hey, Lord, help me to choose A, B, C, D, E. We are always pray about our decision making. But not that many people ask God. Hey, Lord, I want my spirit to be mature. I want me to be strengthened, because if my spirit is mature enough, I even though there might be a huge mountain in front of me, I can have the faith to ask the mountain to move and cast into the ocean. 
So as long as you have enough faith, you will see that the presence of these Canaanites is actually a testimony that God indeed promised this land for us. So we have to know, sometimes you just feel like we have to know in advance, to spy, to know, to know, to have all these like plan. This is not necessarily the best thing to do because we have to f- follow, follow God's path rather than just seeing the circumstances. We, the preparation that we should be doing is to prepare us to follow his have to prepare our spirit man to be strong to prepare our spirit so that we have to trust this is the preparation that we should be doing how can i respond to you how can i respond to your leadership how can i follow your footsteps how can i respond to your words how can i strengthen myself how can i stand for it this is the thing that we need to learn so next in chapter 14 you can see that indeed after 40 years they just wandering the wilderness for 40 years you see the descendants of anon the great people the hebronites and in hebron all these these difficult, most difficult places, all Caleb have it all because Caleb said, "Yes, we can overcome. We can have it. They will be our food." So God, according God, do it according to Caleb's faith. He preserved his strength for forty years. So after forty years, God gave him the same thing that he asked for. And Caleb, he did not complain. Ah, it's all you guys, you people of little faith. You delayed me for forty years, but no, Caleb's faith never changed. So God gave him according to what he asked for. So today, when you are praying for your family your children, your church, or even for the people who are non-believer, pray for God's kingdom, you don't give up. Just keep praying according to your faith, according to, and God will answer us according to our faith. And next, in chapter 14, from verse 1 to 4, all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. All the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would we had died in the wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land, or to fall by the sword? What promised land? What land with the milk and honey? Would that we have died in the land of Egypt? So you can see, this is the rebellion of people against God. If someone is strong enough in their spirit, you should, we should let him to first say, to speak up, and to lead people to action. If you don't have enough faith, if you have a lot of doubt and concern and worriness, then you should just shut up. You know, sometimes maybe you see something that's factual, you have the right analysis, perfect logic, right judgment, all the vision that you see is accurate, but whatever you say, you just make the entire Israelites just grumble. And everyone is like, ah, we are just dying. Why why don't we just die in Egypt? So next in verse four, and they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. So you see that? What did they say? They said, our wives and our little ones, they will become a prey. So indeed, every single word that they said, God has listened, God heard it. So God do it according to their complaints, according to their own conclusion. God fulfill according to what they say. So today, why when we are educating, when we are leading our children, we should tell them that we should not complain. We shouldn't just say, ah, it's so nasty. Ah, I'm so pitiful. Ah, it's so bad of luck. Lord, you didn't take care of me. You didn't provide me. It's unfair. If you are tend to complain, complain to a degree that actually all the mishap, all the complaint, all the premature judgment, you are actually bringing all these curses into your own life. So next in verse five, then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. So in the book of Numbers, whenever you read this word, you should mark it, which is when Moses fell on his face before the assembly. So here in chapter 13, Moses fell on his face one. In chapter 16, Moses fell on his face again. In chapter 20, Moses fell on his face yet again. So these three times when he fell on his face, it's because Moses know that the Israelites just did something that greatly sinned against God. The spirit of Moses is very, very sensitive. He knows that this sin against God. So he immediately fell down on the ground. It's not because he's uh, afraid of the people, but instead it's because he know that they just sinned against God. So these three times when Moses fell on his face, it's all before God's very severe judgment. So sometimes when we sin against God, we don't even know about ourselves, then we have to follow up the life, the footstep of the of our mature leaders so that we can see that, oh yes, we against sin against God, we have to repent immediately, we have to ask for God's forgiveness. And next from verse six to nine, God didn't immediately say anything. 
God allows the people with faith to speak up again first. And from verse seven to nine, you see Caleb and Joshua in what they say. They are not about. They don't bother about the issue where they are gonna die. They just keep talking about God, God, God. So here you see the land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. In verse eight, if the Lord delight in us, He will bring us into this land. In verse nine, do not rebel against the Lord. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. This is the differences between someone who has faith versus someone who does not have faith. From what they say. You can immediately tell what their spiritual、uh, status looks like from the way that they analyze the the、um, the circumstances, analyze the church, the pastor, the brothers and sisters. You know, and they see they maybe they can speak those things, analyze it very well. But when you compare to the one who are really mature in their spirit with faith, they are not talking about circumstances. They talk about God. They talk about God's presence. Here is the place where is open heaven. God will lead. Us. He will provide us. He's abundant. Don't rebel against him. Don't complain. Don't don't mistrust him. Then we just keep coming in front of the Lord. Just praise him. Just pray it because Abba Father, whatever he do is the best. You will believe. Believe that Lord Jesus, you are ruling over this church. You are leading us. So you can see what you say. What you say is actually reflecting your true status in your spirit. Every time we speak up, it's actually. Revealing our true spiritual status, and Moses he immediately fall down because he know that they just sin against God. When Joshua and Caleb they just speak, you can see that how come they have such a great faith in them because their eyes is always focusing on God. This is a great promise that God delights in us. He's with us. Don't rebel against the Lord. So see, but next in verse ten to twelve, let's just stone them, stone them, kill them. So God has to speak out. What let's see what God says. Then next see how. God, How Moses pray about it. So today we are leader intercessor. You really need to learn what Moses pray, how he pray here. It's actually teaching us as a leader, as a pastor, as a small group leader, as a spiritual parent, how you guide the people that you are leading. You will learn how to pray from these part. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people despise me? How long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs that I have done among them. So despise and unbelief. This Actually, trigger God's anger. So, despise means that I think God's leadership is incorrect. God's leadership is blemish. There's blemish. It, this is not the best arrangement. And unbelief means that I don't want to walk on this path. I don't think God can fulfill it. It's impossible. So later on, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. This. So this is the second time that God says exactly the same word. When they were worshiping the golden calf, but here it talks about pestilence. Why do they use pestilence? Because in Leviticus chapter twenty six, we mentioned that about if you、uh, follow his commandment, what are the blessings? If you、uh, rebel against him, what are the curses? And in those curses, remember that we talk about five layers of curses and seven different blessings. And the first layer of, of curses is the pestilence. So God attacked them with pestilence. But here, see how Moses pray about it from verse thirteen to sixteen. The thing that he prayed, the first thing is about God's name, your name, Lord, your nation, and that's why later on Joshua he also learned the same prayer in the failure of the city of Ai. He Joshua did the same prayer, Lord, it's your name, Lord, your name, and then verse thirteen to sixteen, the first prayer Moses had is about his name, Lord, it's your kingdom, it's your nation, and even though the Lord tell Moses, I will make your descendant a a great nation, it's mightier than Israelites, but Moses said, no, no. No, it's your kingdom. It's your nation. It's not mine. Not Israel. Not Jacob. Not the descendant of Moses. Not about people. It's about you. It's your kingdom. Your plan. Your will. Your glorious arrangement. Don't change your plan because of our foolishness, our weaknesses, or our rebellion. So you see, Moses just keep praying for God's kingdom. Lord, yes, we acknowledge we are rebellious, we are sinners, but your promise has to fulfill. Your name has to be lifted up high. Your nation has to be built. Your priestly nation has to exist. Lord, it's yours, not me. So today, when we are praying, we can also pray for God's kingdom. It's not about the prosper of my 
church. Yes, it's but pray about the the church of this land. It's pray for your body. Your body has to prosper. Your kingdom. We have to keep praying about this. We are. We shouldn't just be satisfied when we see other fell and we are prospered and we are happy about it. But no, today we, if we take on the role of Moses, someone might pray that, oh yeah, Lord, may your will be done. Then my descendant will be a mighty nation. But Moses didn't pray that. Moses said, Lord, no, it's not my kingdom. It's yours. It's not people's. It's not even Jacob's. It's yours kingdom. So in verse 17 to 19, he prayed for God's righteousness, his justice, his character, his mercy, his grace, his redemption, his forgiveness. So you see, ask God to reveal his power according to what he said. So that's why we should read the Bible because we need to be familiar with his word. We need to be familiar with his promise and we pray according to his promise. So from verse 17 to 19, God's promise is about what God has said in the past. Talk about God's character. He's merciful. He's loving. He's righteous, justice, merciful, and he will forgive us. You will by no means clear the guilty, but please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love. So here, you, when we are praying, we have to hold on to God's righteousness, but also hold on to his mercy, his forgiveness. This does not mean that he can indulge us, but after his forgiveness, he want his people to learn to fear the Lord and to stay away from sin. So all the forgiveness, you have to pray according to God's righteousness. Forgiveness is to hold on to his mercy and also to hold on to his manifestation in his justice. So today, forgiveness is not a reason for us to keep sinning. And that's why we need to first pray for his kingdom and his righteousness. It's very important. So today, when you are praying for the unbelieving family members or someone who have left church or left their faith, pray for the ones who are no longer coming to the gathering or pray for the unrighteousness. Righteous uh, law uh, nowadays, or all the chaos in the finance and all the pol- politics, we are pray not just pray for the worldly kingdom. We are praying for God's kingdom, Lord. Every single circumstances is to strengthen your kingdom, your church, and your children has to be raised up. So we pray for your righteousness. Pray if today at church there are some corruption, there are fraction, there are comparisons, or even some uh, adultery, that kind of thing. Lord, may you forgive us, cleanse your church cleanse us through your precious blood lord may you manifest your power again so that your people can fear you again know you again so this is moses prayer and this prayer really touched god's heart so next it talks about god's judgment yes indeed god forgive them but he also do according his requirement for his justice to those one who says the evil word who curse who judgment that God says he will judge them. So next in verse 20, the Lord says, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these 10 times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers and none of those who despise me shall see it. So you can see that God's judgment to them is that they will see God's glory but they will not see the promised land. So after 10 times, God they tested God. You see, God remembered very clearly from the beginning by the Red Sea, they complain. Every single complaint, they remember these 10 times. Everything is very clear. So their families that we should not complain against the Lord because they all come in front of the Lord. May the Holy Spirit truly convict us to count how many times we have complained. God knows all of them. And in verse 24, God says, But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. So if we look carefully, that Joshua entered, Caleb entered, and maybe the descendants of Aaron, Eleazar also entered. And what about about the other guys like the 70 elders and the 12 uh, chief who make the offering where are they do they die do they enter into the promised land we don't really know but we know one thing is that we should not overlook God's judgment. Every single time when we fail, when we sin, or when we have judgmental spirit complaint in our church, we are actually losing the eternal promise and God's blessing to us. So we should not overlook or take it lightly. And in verse 25, God's uh, direction for them is that since the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valleys, turn tomorrow and set out for the wilderness by the way to the Red Sea. What does that mean? That mean they have to go back to the wilderness? as a parent. So they just 
go went to the end of the wilderness. Apparent they just finished their trip to Kadesh Barnea from the Mount Sinai. They are about to enter the Promised Land, but now God says, "Go, go, go, go back, go back to the wilderness by the Red Sea." That means go back to the wilderness of Paran. So as they went back, it took another thirty-eight years from verse twenty-six to thirty-nine. Previously, it was God's conversation with Moses, and now Moses is talking to the people. And from verse twenty six to thirty, God asked Moses to declare the judgment. And verse twenty nine, your dead body shall fall in the wilderness, and of all your number, listen in the census from twenty years old and upward, all who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. So actually, the descendants of Aaron they also end. Enter because they are not counted in those twelve tribes. So the tribe of Levi, they actually enter the promised land. And for those who are twenty years old or above, when they are being censored in chapter one, they are listed to fight to inherit the promised land. But here they are listed again. Whoever is above twenty years old and they grumble against me, they cannot enter. So you see that previously God has just give you the promise, but you did not receive it because you grumble because you don't. Don't believe in God because you rebel, you cry. So your outcome is to die in the wilderness. Everyone was above twenty; they are being cursed. So today we have to think about why in the New Testament we say that there will be people who will be crying and gnashing their teeth outside the door of God's grace. That's exactly the same meaning. You are chosen. You are supposed to have grace. You have blessing. But today in your Christian life, you did not hold on to the blessing. So your life is up and down according to circumstances rather than standing. For according to God's promise, so today you eventually we will be just like this. Anyone who is twenty years old and above who grumble against God, they will not be able to enter into the promised land. It's same thing for the Old Testament, and same thing for the New Testament. And in verse thirty one to thirty five, God used two very special words. The first special word is to bear the iniquity or to suffer for. These words drop two times, and the other word is to know, which means to know to understand. So in the beginning, you guys says that our wives and our little ones. They will become prey, and we will fall by the sword. Would it not be better if we die in Egypt? So God give them the same judgment as they have requested. So the first judgment is that you have rejected the land. So your little ones, who you said would become a prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you have rejected. And in verse thirty three, that's the first suffer for that show up. Your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and shall suffer for your faithlessness until the. Last of your dead bodies lie in the wilderness. So here they didn't、uh, have adultery, but why did God talk about faithlessness? It's because they did not acknowledge God. They trust their own judgment. They want to leave God. They want to have another leader to lead them back to Egypt. This is adultery. So today, is there the same thing in nowadays church? There is. Oh yeah, we don't want to listen to this pastor. We find another、uh, mighty man, a powerful man. We will find another minister. Why don't we just go out and have another church? I don't want to listen to this. I don't want to stay under this cover. Let's have another church. Today, many church are being set up like this. Oh, because I don't want to obey. I don't want to follow this leadership. I will have another church. So today, if the church that you are leading. They are going against God's truth. They don't do according to God's word. Then your leaving is God's leadership in purity. But today, if you leave this church, but actually that church, they follow God's will. It's just because the way they do things is different from your judgment, and you just choose to go your own way. Then you will actually suffer for your faithlessness. This is actually terrifying. And from verse thirty four to thirty five, you shall bear your iniquity forty years, and you shall know my displeasure. So the second judgment that God has for them is that I will distance myself from you. You will know my displeasure. I will stay a distance from you. And verse thirty six to thirty eight, the men who brought up a bad report of the land died by a plague before the Lord. So out of those twelve spies, ten spies die immediately. And verse thirty nine to forty, you see there they still live in rebellion. 
Okay, here we are. We'll go up to the place that the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. Yeah, 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 we sin. Yes, forgive us. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can go now. Yeah, we can go to the promise that, yeah, you know, like, even though those 10 spies, they said it's so terrifying, and but God now judges like this. Okay, okay, yeah, we can go. We can go. But we thought, we neglected, we overlooked that we thought that we say those things, and now we sin, and we just can just simply ask God for forgiveness. As if, we give God a huge favor, you know, like, okay, yeah, we will now follow you. You know, sometimes our prayer is like this. You need to repent. You need to uh, return to the Lord. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, I will just repent. Yeah, Lord, forgive me. You know, this kind of lip service prayer is exactly the same thing as verse 39, 40, you know, their families, God didn't answer their prayer. They sinned already. They said, oh yeah, we sinned. May you forgive me. No, they didn't, for they did not truly repent. So their prayer is still in their flesh. They just say it like very unwillingly. This kind of prayer is useless. It's no value in front of God. So in verse 41 to 45, why now you are transgressing the command of the Lord when that will not succeed? Do not go up. Because at that time, they have this de de determination already. In verse 44, they presume to go up to the heights of the hill country, although neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed out of the camp. So they said, yeah, 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 we will go fight them since this is God's promise and we can go. But you, you have to to really hear this. What is the meaning of obedience? The obedience is that whatever God asks us to do, we will do. But there is a kind of rebellion is that I say I'm do something for God, but God actually say nothing about it. I say that I will do it for the Lord. This is rebellion. If God asks you not to go, but you go, this is rebellion. If God asks you to go, but you refuse to go, this is also rebellion. So what is the true obedience? Is that God says, no, you guys shouldn't go now at this moment again you should go back turn back to the red sea to the wilderness if we just follow it if we just go back then this is obedience you know you never know maybe god will relent about the 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 curses that he has maybe the people who are above 20 maybe they can still go to the promised land you know god often do this, this kind of thing God is not about the law, it's not about the judgment, it's not limited by that. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We have the opportunity to return to the Lord, to touch His heart, to truly repent. But rather than say, oh yeah, now I can go and try to salvage the, the result by your own flesh, and then... But we have to know how to listen to God's guidance to really ask His will in detail. You know, sometimes the consequences, you have made the consequences. We have sinned. Now the consequences, how can we, how can we return? How can we make it better? We cannot do it according to our own will. We cannot do it according to our own impulse. We have to follow God's leadership. So their family here, chapter 13 and 14, the Israelites, they just enter into the third stop. The mistake in the first stop, the mistake in the second stop. But here, the third stop, this truly is a huge mistake. And this huge mistake bring a very terrifying judgment. But if after the judgment, the people, they really surrender, they go back to the wilderness. And in the wilderness, they offer the guilt offering for the sin of the people and the leaders. They offer a burnt offering, grain offering, and then offer a peace offering. Maybe all these curses and judgment, it can be overridden. It can change. But people, they don't know God's heart. They treat the ceremony as ceremony. They treat offering as offering. They just only look at their own right. They take they only look at their own advantage. They don't know God's heart. Nowadays, many Christians are like this. Today, Christ has given us a new and living way through His precious blood, through thorough repentance, through seeking His guidance. All the curses in our life can be turned into blessings. Mercy can triumph over judgment. But today, if we still insist on our own way, then we try to save the result by our own method. We try to change the result. We actually still live in rebellion. Then God says, this is adultery, this is faithlessness, and we have to bear this sin, and God will distance himself from us. We will know his displeasure on us. So in verse 13, chapter 13 and 14, today, Christian, nowadays church, we have to pray about these two chapters. We said, Lord, may you give us the same prayer of Moses, how to touch your name, touch your kingdom, touch your heart, touch your character, touch your righteousness, touch your mercy, touch your goodness. Remember every single word that you have. Let our promise to follow 
follow your will to lead us step by step moving forward until we enter into the promised land. Amen. Dear families, we hope that you enjoy the Bible race as much as we do. If you are willing to volunteer to translate the original Chinese teaching into English or assist with video editing, please email service at 360sunrise.com. Thank you.